Okay, good morning. It's 8 a.m. and it's 5 a.m. in BC. So we're now going to have Mike. Good morning, Mike. Hey, good morning, everybody. I think um, I have to commend um, our team for being ahead of the clock this morning. So that's pretty good. We're going to make a quick start promptly. So over to you, Mike. Good morning. With session number eight, water treatment. All right. Let me get my video started here. Perfect. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's uh, it is 5 a.m. for me. It's a bit of a time change, so I got to sleep in an extra hour this morning. So. I have a little different venue this morning, so I'm coming from uh, my water plant this morning instead of my house, so a um, little bit different camera view. So we're going to be doing lecture number eight this morning, and um, we went through all the treatment process uh, stuff over the last seven chapters, and right from taking water from our, our upland sources, our sor source water ground or uh, surface water. We learned how to take some of the big stuff out, some of the colloids and, and the cloudy water and the color uh, using the coagulation process and flocculation and different types of sedimentation. Uh, we talked a whole bunch about filters and then we talked last week about all the different special uh, treatment processes that are out there to remove metals and, and um, minerals, you know, calcium hardness and magnesium, as well as iron and manganese. So now that water is all treated, and um, now what do we do with it? And that's going to be the big question here. Um, we're going to kind of go through a two part. Uh, so, week eight here and week nine, we're going to go through water storage and hydraulics today. And we're going to get farther into some of the mechanisms, like more of the pump stations and some pumps and stuff. So we'll work on that on, on week nine. So today we're going to look at different types of water storage. So once that water leaves your facility, what happens? And there's some different things we'll talk about too, because not all systems are the same. Um, in Canada here, uh, we have a really probably a unique problem is that in some of our colder climates, um, there is no pipe network, which means the ground is too frozen to put pipes into. So um, water treatment plants will make the water, they'll have big tanks and those, um, basically those, uh, we use tanker trucks and those trucks will pull up to the water plant. We fill those trucks up and they go and deliver water to everybody's house. And then another truck comes behind it and takes all the sewage away. Um, very unique, um, you know, but again, you cannot bury um, any sort of pipe. Other places we have here, they have something called a utilidor. And basically all the pipes are there, and, but they're above ground in these heated uh, shacks. And I'll try to get some pictures of that during the break. But, um, you know, instead of buried in the ground, these pipe networks are above ground in heated little covered units. Um, you know, it could be for kilometers. It's quite unique to have different types of uh, water uh, transmission. But what we're gonna teach you and part of the test is going to be your basic water storage and hydraulics. So that's using reservoirs and a whole bunch of different pipes. So we'll get going on that today. Let me um, get my presentations sorted out here. Chat back up here. All right, can you guys see my presentation? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Perfect, thank you. I'm using different screens, so I had you guys over here and I got you guys over here. Okay, 
So weak eight, uh, water, starch, and hydraulics. Okay, so you know you guys have all had me before, so you know you know been doing this a long time. I'm happy to be doing this for you guys and helping you get to uh, write your EBC exam, and as well as hopefully you learn a little bit about all these different lectures that we're we're uh, putting forward. Um, I, I'm. For me too, it's learning. Every time I do one of these courses, I, I learn as well. So more than happy to be doing this. So today, basically, we're going to look at the overview of the storage facilities and, and the purpose and the types and stuff. And we'll describe the purpose of storage, the, the major aspects, why we do this, right? And there's a bunch of things that happens when we deal with storage. Um, and maintenance, right? Like everything, we got to maintain our um, systems just like we have to maintain our water plant. So we got to make sure that uh, everything is working and it's safe and it provides safe potable water. The influence of the treatment process on desired water quality is a big factor, right? So all the treatment processes we talked about this morning, we have to get that water ready to go through the pipe network and into our storage reservoirs. If that water's too aggressive, which means that maybe the pH is too low or it doesn't have enough minerals in it, it will actually eat some of the pipe network. If it's too, um, have too many minerals or it's hard, or the pH is too high, we might have issues with pipes crusting up or having incrustation in the pipe, it blocks up the pipe, also, too, we got to make sure that the pressures are correct so that we're not doing damage to our pipe network. So making sure that when the water leaves your facility, it's ready to go. Also, too, for chlorine, it has to have enough chlorine in it so that it's getting to your customer. It might be perfect leaving your plant, but what happens out in that system is really important, too. We have to look at a bunch of things. These two big ones are chemical and microbiological. So chemically, that's what you're adjusting in your treatment facilities and making sure that the pH and everything's correct leaving. But you also want to make sure that there's no microbiological issues there. Right? Chlorine is going to be your big thing here to make sure that everything is going to be good. And it might be good leaving your um, plant, but make sure it's going to be good out there in the system. And that means you've got to do some maintenance and making sure that um, you're flushing and making sure that everything is fresh because you don't want to create any issues out there, especially disinfection byproducts or any coliforms or iron bacteria. Those are the things that we start to see. So water distribution system monitoring, again, you, we know the water's good leaving your plant. We have to make sure that we're testing throughout your system. And that's just doesn't mean one place. Let's look at all through your places. You should be looking at your first customer always. And that's a good indication of what uh, the majority of your customers are going to get. You're also going to find a customer that's midpoint, as well as you're going to find a customer at the very end. And you want to make sure that the water quality from start to finish is acceptable. They're going to be a little bit different because the chlorine is going to be less as it goes through the system. But you have to make sure that you know that water is good. You don't you don't want water that's been sitting in a reservoir for too long, and that causes some issues here. Water use in any sort of community is vary depending on what you are providing for your customer. It could be a number of different things, right? Um, and you also have to design your system for what could happen. You just don't know. There's emergencies that could happen and you got to make sure that things are designed so that you can uh, weather any sort of uh, an event. Before I move on from there, one of the things when we looked at what a community has, there's a lot of communities that, that provide um, just service for drinking water. Some 
um, for drinking water and fire protection. And then some communities have drinking water, fire protection, and irrigation, and irrigation for farming practices. Uh, here, where I live, there's a lot of farming. So I, I will put out um, 11 million liters a day out of this treatment plant I'm standing in today um, during the winter. And as soon as irrigation comes on, I could be making flows of 50 or 60 million liters a day. That's a change of 40 million liters a day <clears throat> just because we're um, irrigating crops for um, mostly it's grapes for wine, to be honest, but that's, that's a customer and we have to be ready for that. Those are huge, big demands on our system. As well, I, ha I have to also make sure I'm providing my domestic service and making sure that the uh, fire protection is in there. So let's talk about some of the components a little bit. Let's talk about a clear well first, and I'm gonna keep going through a clear well. This is a definition you're gonna see in the books um, and also uh, on the test it comes up. And clear well basically is the beginning of your distribution system. This is when uh, the first storage tank as um, your treatment process ends at your plant and it goes into a storage container. It is a reservoir per se, but it's the first reservoir. It's usually at the beginning at the distribution system. And that's usually what they are. And we'll, we'll talk about clear wells a little bit more in a bit here. They encompass a storage reservoir. And basically we want to put these storage reservoirs out there. It's not realistic for a water plant to just be um, putting water out and um, you know, uh, satisfying the demand of your customer. One big thing here is there's things that happen out there, right? People take baths and showers and wash their vehicles and there's, there's irrigation and there's fires and there's water breaks and there's sometimes there's power outages. All these things happen out there. And you also have to make sure that you can provide water during the time that it's going to be quite high in usage. And that's usually around the dinner hour, right? So when people come home from work and they're gonna be using water for cooking or using water for you know, showers or bathing, you have to be ready for that. So you wanna be able to provide enough storage out there so your plant runs very, very smooth and you don't have all that back and forth. Again, one of the biggest thing is, is also protection, right? What happens if there's something happens at your treatment plant? And the big ones are gonna be usually, for here anyway, it's going to be power interruptions. So when a power interruption happens, you're not gonna be able to provide that service. Um, also, there could be a, a problem with um, a piece of equipment at your plant. You gotta be, uh, you know, gotta have enough storage out there to make sure that you can um, you know, still provide your customer water. And it's just not drinking water, you guys. Think about your fire hydrants. Your fire hydrants are also serviced from the same water. There's a lot of people out there that think that the fire hydrants and your drinking water are two different things. And they're really not. They're exactly, you know, that reservoir provides service to both. So if I don't have drinking water, I also don't have fire protection. And that's super important. So you have to look at stuff like that, um, basically, and also to distribution uh, breaks. So looking at any breaks in your transmission lines or your service lines. Um, fire is also a big one here. Uh, this year we had a, a major uh, fire um, around our community. And uh, because we're around a lot of forests, um, it came really close and we had to be ready for that. And, you know, and because of that, it, it interrupted our power and we had to be ready for any sort of emergency, right? And that's your floods, your fires, your uh, poor weather events. And, and you know, you guys down there, you have a uh, lot uh, more uh, adverse weather than we do. Although we have snow, but you guys have some pretty nasty stuff down there as well. It's a picture of one of my storage reservoirs, and we'll talk a little bit about this. This is one that's actually in ground, 
and it's a fairly large one. This is about um, almost six million liters of water could be in this one. Um, what you see is just a covered dome and it's recessed into the ground up on a hill. Now, if you look really closely behind it, you also have, um, where's my drawing guy here? Up here, there's houses up here. So there's no way that this reservoir could service that. So this reservoir has to only service houses that are below it. I'll, I would have a pump station over here and it would pump to another reservoir up way up here to provide service to all those houses that you see here. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk hydraulics here in a bit. But that is an in-ground reservoir. And this is pretty typical what we'd see here in Canada. Um, I have five reservoirs like this. They're all in-ground and they're all, uh, and again, that's protect from frost and, and weather for us because we can get quite cold. Although, um, Ignatius says that you guys are around 28 degrees and that's pretty nice. Um, it's better than um, a minus temperature, which is what we got sometimes. So why do we do storage? Anyway, and, and these are the three big ones. And when they ask you this on the test, these are the ones that are going to be the, the ones they're going to talk about. Uh, storage of treated water is for the following purposes, fire protection. It's for equalization, so peak demands and emergencies. So this is a reserve, so you got to do maintenance, or if there's a main break or a fire or anything, um, it's ready to go. And that's what you got to think about. You have to look at your customer, you have to look at what your infrastructure looks like, and you have to be able to um, plan for all three of these events. And this is the main purpose of water storage. How they calculate this is, this is really interesting, is, is it's A plus B plus C. And A is your fire storage. It's the number one design criteria when they look at a reservoir. And they wanna make sure that you can facilitate uh, storage for fire. Equalization. And that's 25% of the maximum day demand. And that's the most amount of water that you can put out for that day. And then 25% of it is going to be the emergency storage. And that's 25% of A plus B. So then properly size your storage facility, you have to look at all these factors. You need to have also volume, it says here, for filter backwash, because we know now also when we looked at our backwashing, that that water comes out of your storage. So now you also have to calculate that is that's going to be part of your demand or part of your customer is using water for backwashing. So always remember that. One of the advantages to storage is it maintains adequate pressure, right? It's really important to not fluctuate pressure out in your system. If you do so, what happens is that your pipes will end up being uh, damaged or your customer's taps or your customer's piping. You want to ensure the reliability of supply. If you have more storage, you can make your piping smaller. If I had to provide service all the time, my pipes would be really big. So in order to reduce the size of those pipes, I can actually have more storage on the hill. It also proves, improves operational flexibility. I can turn off to do maintenance. I can, I can you know, do, turn down the flow, turn up the flow. I can change some things in my process. And again, industrial customers, and for us, agricultural customers, because they use a lot of water for different uh, purposes. Um, for here, because we're almost desert-like, and people like to grow grass, and that's the big difference here. It's, it's, it's really weird that people like green grass and we don't get a lot of rain. So we end up using the water treated water supply to water grass. And that's really, it's really hard to see because, you know, a lot of that water, I come to work very early in the morning and I see a lot of water running down the street because, it, you know, it washes off people's uh, green grass. And there's so much of that. And it's really strange. 
um, you know, in, in this mindset in water and conservation that people are still using water irresponsibly. We know, we know this only because we, we look very carefully at what's returning back to the wastewater treatment. So if I'm putting out 42 million liters out of my plant today, and only 10 million liters are going back into the um, collection towards wastewater treatment. So I know that's being used for basically purposes of cooking and consumption and everything else is being used for usually irrigation pools and other, other things and not that stuff gets washed down the drain. There's a number of different types of storage facilities and a lot of these are dictated by where you are in the world. Uh, clear wells, we talked about clear wells and we'll talk about a little bit more, is usually used at the treatment plant. And that's, um, that's your first tank. And you, a lot of the times that clear well is used in the water that's in it to be used for the backwash for the uh, filter system. You also have elevated tanks. So if you live in a very flat area, you're going to end up with that. So let me just do a quick drawing here. And I think I have some other. So if I'm nice and straight like this, and let me make this blue. There's no hills. And we'll talk about this in hydraulics. So I'm going to basically put a water storage tank up here. And now that water sits in this tank up here and it could feed down. So it needs gravity to feed to your house. <clears throat> and if it's flat, there's no gravity. A standpipe is, a, is, is used, that's another type. And it's basically, it looks like this. It's very similar to an elevated storage tank, but it's a solid tank like this. You know, for Canadian usage, and what I see a lot of is usually ground level tanks, and that's like that one that I showed you a little earlier in that picture. And that partial, you know, they could be fully buried or partially buried. And I think I have some different uh, pictures of it coming up here. We also talked about clear wells, right? Uh, below ground, made of concrete. Concrete's usually the the, the choice of, of most of these reservoirs, I've seen some different materials used. In the olden days, I've, I've actually seen wood stave type ones. Um, again, we don't see that kind of stuff too much anymore, but typically it's concrete in ground. A clear well is also basically used for storage of filtered water right after the treatment plant. Um, and a lot of time it can actually be used as a chlorine contact tank. So when you add the chlorine, it will go through a maze of contact time. And I'll show you in this next picture right here. You can see here inside a clear well, it usually has something called a baffle system inside. And you can see that it allows the water to travel and to be um, take a, a path so that you A, you don't get stagnant water and B, um, you get good mixing in there for the chlorine as well. And this works really well. My clear well like this is exactly like that. Next picture I'm going to show you is a, is a reservoir. And a lot of reservoirs are underground or hidden. And sometimes there's parks on top of it. And this particular one here, you can see, you wouldn't even know that that's a storage reservoir. It's blended quite uh, into the um, surrounding uh, landscape. You can see the venting and stuff that is that is you know on top here. Very important to as an operator for you guys is to make sure you're inspecting these so that they're sealed. It should let air in, but they should be um, uh, have some sort of screening on it so that it's not going to um, you know promote any sort of um, mice or, or any sort of animal getting inside there and contaminating your reservoir or even people, right, putting stuff in there. So making sure that the security is, is good. Also too, your hatches and stuff, your entrance hatches need to be locked and they need to be checked often to make sure that nothing's tampered with these reservoirs.
we'll talk now about a little bit of elevated tanks, right? And, and when I'm talking about elevated tanks, I'm talking about something that looks like this, right? And this, as you can see in the background, very, very flat area here. And in order to get the height or the gravity, I'm going to have to pump the water to the top of this tank here and making sure, you know, and that the height of that tank provides the basically the pressure that's needed to bring that water to people's houses. It's basically a water tank supported by a steel or a concrete tower um, and the tanks way above the ground. Okay. Um, and again, it's to per, uh, promote really constant pressure or pressure in general to your distribution network. One thing here, pressure in the distribution system will vary with the water level in the tank. And that goes with any tank out there, right? Level is equal to pressure. So if you have more water in your, in your reservoir, you're going to have more pressure. And that's really important. Level is equal to pressure always. We talked a little bit about um, those standpipes. And standpipes are going to work really similarly to um, the elevated tanks that we saw. And a, lot, a lot of the times they're steel. Um, and, and again, with steel and water, we got to be careful, right? If your water is really aggressive, we have to take good care to make sure that these are going to be protected. A lot of them, as we learned in our last lecture, would be used with that uh, cathodic protection or that deferring the corrosion to a sacrificial anode. A lot of the times these reservoirs are going to be, if they're not on the, the big pedestal, they're gonna be on top of a hill or the highest point in your distribution network to provide the most amount of gravity possible. You're gonna need pumps um, to provide water from your clear well to maybe one of these reservoirs or storage tanks and get the water way up. Again, storage in general, we talked about that, starts large volumes of water. And when I say large volumes, it depends on your system. My reservoirs out there, I have 2 million liters um, reservoirs to 6 million liters reservoir. And my clear well is actually 8 million liters. So I have a lot of storage out there for any issues. So yesterday I ended up having um, a power outage and it was out for four hours. So I have to be sure that can I provide service to my customer when I have no power for four hours. And sometimes that's hard to do. I've worked in other um, places that I've only had 15 minutes before I would run out of water. And that's a pretty scary thing to do. Again, all these should be, they should be easy to operate and maintain. Um, they need to be um, you know, accessible so that you can do inspections and always good to do inspections. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. The other type is reservoirs are buried in ground. And this is the most typical one. It's usually concrete construction. It's usually on a hill uh, way above the, um, the town that it's servicing. We use this when large quantities of water must be stored and where you actually have a hill to put this reservoir up there. Always covered because you've got treated water and you want to maintain this. So the, these, these structures are covered. They have air venting so that uh, it, they can breathe, but the venting has to always be screened to keep things out. They have hatches so that you can open up and take a look on the inside and confine space. So some places what they'll do is they'll empty the tank and people use their confined space gear and they'll go in and they clean the reservoir up and we'll talk about that. We don't do that here. I actually have a diver with a vacuum that goes down uh, every couple of years and they will inspect the walls with a camera and then they would go in with a vacuum cleaner and they clean up the bottom, any sediment, 
and well the reservoir is in service so I don't have to take it out and I don't have to drain it it's done all there Some smaller well systems will use something called a hydro pneumatic tank. And basically it's a small version of a reservoir, right? Basically a pump or a well pump and some smaller systems will pump to this tank and you'll see it here. That's that silver tank. And that silver tank will provide service to your customer. And when it gets empty, it triggers or you know works on pressure when it, the pressure gets low enough, it will target the pump to come on. The pump comes on and repressurizes the, um, the tank here, and that tank will provide service. And that works really well. One thing about these, um, making sure that they're clean, they have a, usually a rubber bladder or some sort of material on the inside. So after a, a time, especially if you're using chlorinated water, uh, these will deteriorate. So you gotta make sure that they're um, always maintained. When we talk about the operation of any sort of storage reservoir, um, you know, here's something to consider. Uh, always fill the tanks during um, off-peak electrical demands. This is the really big problem when, um, when the water demand is the most, it's usually when the electrical demand is the most. So think about that. Um, even right now, people are now getting up um, in the next couple of hours here. So um, I should make sure that my water tanks, all my reservoirs should be full when people are getting up because I don't want to all of a sudden start turning all my pumps on and getting all that water out there well, everybody's getting up and using their toasters and, and using appliances and the electrical demand goes up. Same thing goes when people come home from work. People come home from work and if I have my pumps running, filling tanks, well, everybody's home cooking and getting ready for you know, their evenings. And so what you try to do is fill the tanks up during the time where everybody's at work or when people are sleeping so that when there is time, um, you know, we're not pumping while there's an electrical demand from the customer. And again, you want to maintain uh, specified minimum pressures all the time. It's not good to fluctuate the pressures throughout your system. And that just becomes an issue. Um, it's never good. And again, if it's automated, always make sure that your, make, uh, your level and your pressure transmitters are operating correctly. If they're not, then it could cause a lot of issues for your system. So if you're uh, looking at, um, say, a level transmitter to turn on and off your pump, make sure that is calibrated and checked often and that your safeguards are in place. We do this all the time here. I'll send people out to inspect and make sure that the flight bulbs and the transmitters are all working correctly so that we don't have any issues. So storage levels, we talked a little bit about that. Your staff will go out, they're gonna look at your storage levels. <clears throat> Usually it's just a number on the tank, right? And you know, you're on your SCADA and you're looking at it, that tank is 50% or 60% and that's what it's telling you but let's make sure it's actually working that way. There's a number of different ways you can read level from the tank. You can use an electrode or a float switch. You can use a ultrasonic sensor, and we'll see one of those in a second. A pressure switch. You can actually put a switch at the bottom, right? And it'll sense pressure of the water, which will um, correspond to a level. Differential pressure. Or an altitude valve. A lot of places use altitude valves and we'll talk about an altitude valve uh, in a couple slides here. Here's some different types of, of um, probes that are out there. This is really common. The first one here is going to be like your ultrasonic. It's actually mounted above the tank as you can see in the left picture and it's beaming down and it's actually reading the top of the water and it tells you what's going on in there. 
And our middle one here, this is the floats. There's different floats that will tell you what's going on. It might not give you a number necessarily, but it'll definitely say, okay, my tank is now empty. It'll trigger a pump to come on or a pump to go off or whatever needs to happen. And there's usually a number of different bul bulbs. Here you see probably a low level and a low, low level and a high level and a high, high level. And that's the four bulbs that you see in that middle picture. And then the other one is going to be a pressure transmitter. And you can see this one's pretty neat that it's um, sensing the pressure of the water, right? And that's the amount of pressure pushing down on that probe. And it's taking a signal and it's sending it via radio or some sort of uh, telemetry to another transmitter. And that's some what getting more and more common nowadays is to have that transmission. Let's talk a little bit about maintenance. And again, all storage facilities should be uh, inspected every three to five years. Um, and you're gonna be looking at, and it should be a pretty comprehensive one. Especially stuff like concrete, right? You're gonna be looking for cracks and leaks over time, especially these ones that are buried. They're going to move around, right? In Canada here, what happens, unfortunately, is because we have such a fluctuation in temperature, uh, last week I was minus 13, today I'm plus 13. And because of that, the ground actually moves because the frost and the cold in the ground will actually cause structures to um, expand and contract because of the temperature differences. And it causes cracks, which will cause leaks. So you have to be really aware of that. Uh, you're also going to look at your overflow and your vents and stuff. And over time, because the vents are usually going to be uh, uh, stainless steel or something like that, you have to make sure that the, um, there's no rust. You got to make sure that they're not blocked up and that they're, that they're covered, that they, they have a screen to keep out any birds or, or mice or anything like that. You're also going to, vandalism is a big one, right? Kids like to come in and they beat up things and they, and they, and they vandalize some of our stuff. And we got to make sure that that's always number one. My, um, my storage re reservoirs are, are inspected twice a week. We're looking at the locks. We're looking at the, the tanks themselves, making sure that everything is safe. If those got those big towers, like those big elevated towers, you want to make sure aviation warning lights are installed on them because you don't want anything to fly into these things. Um, they shouldn't, planes really shouldn't be that low in the first place, but just in case, right? You don't want any issues with uh, anything flying into these tanks. There's a couple of different ways to clean and we talked a little bit about that. The way that was done in the past was you would have to drain these tanks out. <clears throat> you would clean, go in and clean with a high pressure washer or basically scrubbing. You'd go in there in usually a pressure washer and your staff would go in there with confined space gear and they would clean the walls of these reservoirs. Um, and then what they would do is they would apply a chlorine solution to the walls and would have to sit there for a, a time. And I think we'll talk about that in a second. But that's typically. Nowadays, what I'm finding is that um, a lot of the um, maintenance can be done while the water's still in the tank and you don't have to disrupt it from service. We use, we use divers and it works really well. Corrosion control too for those metal structures that you saw, those big metal structures. Those are huge. So you gotta make sure that basically um, that they're painted or coated for that matter. And that, um, you know, your water itself, the water that you're treating is stable. It has calcium carbonate saturation. It's protecting the inner structure of that reservoir. If you can't, you're gonna have to put some sort of chemical additive in your water or a corrosion inhibitor or what we talked about last lecture is that cathodic protection, which is super important.
if I'm down there and I use that first method, not the diver, but actually draining that reservoir, I'm going to be uh, going in there and I'm going to take my pressure washer and I'm going to clean this reservoir. Or in the case of <clears throat> um, a metal reservoir, you might paint it or do a repair or anything. When there has been no water in a reservoir, you have to properly treat this reservoir before it can go back in service. So basically what I would do here is you can do it two ways. You can add chlorine to the water, refill the tank after it all has been done, and you have to maintain a free chlorine residual at 50 parts per million or 50 milligrams per liter for six hours, but preferably 24. Then you have to drain that water and dechlorinate. And that's one way to do it. Another way which is causes, uh, it's a lot easier to deal with because then your water's ready to go is before you add uh, chlorinated water to this particular storage, you spray the walls down with a uh, 50 to 200 part per million solution. And you let that soak into the walls for six hours. And then you fill with water and it usually ends up being pretty close after it's all done to the uh, desired chlorine residual that you are that you want and that way you're not wasting too much water. This method that you see here, you will have to dechlorinate that water or remove that water out of this tank again, dechlorinate it and basically um, that's a lot of water in some cases. If I had to do that to my reservoirs, that's another 6 million liters of water that I have to uh, discharge somewhere else. It all depends on your health authority. And so it's always good to check with the proper agency before you, you go ahead. Uh, the AWWA standard has these two standards available, and it's one that's probably used the most um, out there. But the big one is, is to maintain the free chlorine residual as at least 50 parts per million or 50 milligrams per liter for six hours. And that is a test question that you're going to find on the ABC exam. So make sure you understand that. You know, not necessarily a problem you guys have, uh, ice formation, but it does show up in the testing sometimes. And, um, you know, uh, we saw this what happened in the southern states here in the last little bit. They actually had reservoirs that had ice that formed and it damaged uh, a lot of things. Uh, we're so used to it here in Canada, and that's why a lot of our tanks are not elevated. They're buried in the ground to protect against ice. But you always have to be careful about ice out there. Um, again, level um, transmitters and stuff, nothing really works well with ice in the tanks. Um, so you got to be careful when, you know, you saw that ultrasonic uh, that was measuring. It would actually look at ice and the water levels dropping, dropping, and you got an ice layer here. So that does happen, but you have to be, you know, you have to be aware that ice is out there and it will, will happen, especially here in Canada. It definitely does happen. A lot of what I do is I try to move water more through my reservoir. I like to cycle it so that we actually have uh, very little ice formation. Our water in our reservoir is usually around uh, maybe two degrees in the, in the winter time. It's pretty darn cold, but all our pipes are underground. All the reservoirs are underground and protected, but it definitely is very, very cold. One of the other things that's really important, and we talked about this, and we'll talk about this more at the end of this lecture when we talk about a little bit about cross connection, is the maintaining of positive pressure. And positive pressure meaning <clears throat> the uh, water in the pipe has more pressure than the surrounding um, uh, land mass, or even if it's going through any water. And that, what happens is that if there was a leak, that water will come out of the pipe and not water going into the pipe. We don't want any contamination going into the pipe. So when any, at any time where the pressure inside the pipe is lower than the pressure outside, that can cause a lot of issues. We want the pressure in there to be uh, high. Now there's situations out there that can cause pressure to lower. And one is operating a fire hydrant 
When you operate a fire hydrant and you create a lot of water flow through there, what happens is that it can actually lower the pressure in the surrounding mains and it will actually draw out water and, and cause a lot of issues and could cause contamination. A water break is the same thing. If you get a major water break, all that pressure in the main depressurizes and you can definitely get some contamination. <clears throat> One of the other things I see here a lot uh, is something called the altitude valve. And it's a really interesting, and let me take a little bit of a drawing here. Let's make this blue. All right, so I have my reservoir up here, my blue reservoir. And I have my distribution network here. I'm gonna use my pipe, my red pipe is gonna go into here. And this altitude valve here, I'm gonna put that right there. It's gonna be right here. Okay, and let's, and because it's St. Saint, Saint Patty's Day, we're gonna use green for water. So water's gonna travel this way, and this is your customer over here. Water's gonna travel this way. And under normal circumstances, our treatment plant can provide water to my customer, no problem. As, as the demand is, you know, starting to, you know, lessen and there's no demand, water could be transferred into my storage reservoir and it will sit up here. People come home from work, they're going to start taking more and more showers. I want to keep my flow pretty constant coming from my water plant right here. So what happens is that when it's going and the pressure starts to get lower and lower, this valve here will open, allowing this water here to supplement the water coming from your treatment plant. This thing works really well, but there is a problem though. If you have not a lot of demand here, this water in this tank up here can sit here for a long time because it only works on demand. So when the pressure in that main becomes low, that reservoir now supplements. It doesn't supplement all the time, only when it drops below pressure. So you can imagine if you have a long stretch of time that that reservoir has not been in operation, that the water quality potentially in that reservoir could be poor. So that's always something as an operator you have to be aware of that using this type of method. I always like the, um, if I had my way, that your treatment plant here would fill your reservoir and the reservoir would feed your system. That's why you're always getting water moving through everything. With an altitude valve, you have the potential to kind of shut off a reservoir. That, that, had, and that water can become very stagnant at times. And it's really, you know. Now, if your system's really undersized and you know that that valve's always going to be used, then this works really well. It's just at the time when it's not, that becomes an issue sometimes. So always keep that in mind. And that's an altitude valve. It only opens when the pressure in the main becomes low and it takes water from a nearby reservoir and adds it to that pipe and creates, you know, brings that pressure back to where it should be. And that's an altitude valve. SCADA, and we, we touched a little bit on the SCADA systems. And the SCADA system, what it's end up going to be doing is it, um, it talks, it connects all our systems and all our devices together so that you guys sitting in front of your control rooms, you can actually see what's going on. So you're going to see different ways of communication. Some are actually wired together, and some work on radio 
and are different types of technology. But what happens is that it will, it will um, talk to your main system. So you as an operator can open up a valve sitting at your control room and open up a valve in a station that's quite far away. And that's pretty cool. It just, be, it gives you the ability to remote control or to automate anything in your system or also be able to look at it. So I can be sitting here and I know that I can look at the pressure or the level on my reservoirs. And that's pretty cool. We're seeing this more and more and more now. Um, and allows us to, you know, I can take my computer home and I can open up that computer and I can run my treatment plant on my computer, which is pretty cool. Like all things, and I'm gonna harp on this a bit, a maintenance log is super important. Logging of all distribution maintenance work is helpful. So every system and every um, piece of the puzzle should have um, a book, right? So every chamber, every um, booster station, uh, at your reservoir, you should have a log of maintenance. You should have a work plan to know when the last maintenance was done and by who and what was done. So you have to make sure that that's, you know, because what happens if you do get a, a call for an outbreak or something happens that you have the ability to um, do that repair and knowing that it's documented correctly. All systems also should have an active cross connection control program. And that uh, we'll talk about in a bit. This ensures that you know water goes one way. When I sell you water or give you water to your customer, I don't want it back. If it goes to your house, I don't want it coming out of your house, going back into the main. Once it goes past my valves into your house, it is yours. I don't want it back because I don't know what you did with that. And so I wanna make sure that we're being safe. We'll do a little bit of pressure. And again, pressure by definition is basically a force acting on an area, right? And it's basically force over area. And that's a definition of pressure. We are applying a force over a given area. Typical units, and it's funny, right? Uh, PSI is imperial, and that's used a fair bit. And that's saying that one pound over one square inch. Um, in metric here, we use the unit pascals, and we see more often kilopascals definitely when we're talking about pressure. What is a pascal exactly? It's basically pressure. It's, it, it's a newton over a meter square, and that's a pascal. We, because it's such a small unit, we tend to use kilopascals. This is a pretty interesting concept here before we, we go on a break. But I'm gonna show you a couple of things here before we go on a break too. At sea level, um, atmospheric pressures 14.7 PSI or 101.4 kilopascals. And that is atmospheric pressure. It represents a pressure exerted by a column of air. It is what is, um, it's pushing down on all of us all the time. So when I look at my pressure gauge, it should read 14.7 PSI because really that's the pressure pushing down on it. But it says zero. And when it says zero, it's basically gauge pressure. It is what's read on the gauge and it's PSI G. Absolute pressure sometimes, let's call it PSI A and it's equal to the gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure. So if I had a gauge in my hand right now <clears throat> and it didn't have, I wasn't hooked up to anything, there should be 14.7 PSI or 101.4 kilopascals on that gauge. And that's called absolute pressure. But most of the gauges we use, right, if it's not hooked up to anything, says zero. And that means that it's PSI gauge or PSI G.
We're going to talk a little bit now about the piezometric surface or the free water surface sur uh, surface in a hydraulic system. We're going to start getting into hydraulics now, right? And it's basically, it's the surface of the water which is in contact with the atmosphere. Whenever we pump water from one place to another, it starts open to atmosphere, ends open to atmosphere. So we have to move that water. The pressure that's on the surface of the atmospheric pressure is equal to one atmosphere. And we talked about atmospheres, right? These are your main ones. So 14.7 PSI in 101.4 kilopascals, it could be 33 feet or 10 meters. So if I had 10 meters of water in my reservoir, it's equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So level is equal to pressure. And that's really, really important to think about. Um, PSI as well, right? All these are equal. One atmosphere. Or one bar, if you want to put it that way. And that's the atmosphere concept. All right, before we go for a bit of a break, I'm going to show you something here. I'm just going to stop share for a second. Bear with me. I'm going to take a look at something here. All right, I can't seem to get that to work. I'll work on that. Ignatius, we're going to take a five minute break. It's uh, 5.57 my time and we'll take a five minute break and we'll be back. Okay, five minute break it is. Thank you. All right, everybody's back. Okay, I'm going to share with you a couple of things before we move forward. So what I was able to do is since I'm here at the treatment plant this morning, I'm going to show you um, actually the screens this morning. So let's take a look at this. Let me know if you can see this. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Hopefully it works, good. Actually, this is the plant right now. We're actually producing water right now. And what I wanna kind of show you is how, you know, how, how the tank system works. Um, let me just get my, um, my pen out here. I will use, I'll use pink. So if you can see that. So basically today, um, I've got a couple things happening here today. So if you can see it, you can see the number of tanks we have. So right now I have one pump right here. If you look at the lower left corner of the screen and we have one pump running. And it's basically taking 6 million liters, you can see it right here, from the lake, and it's bringing it to the treatment plant. So this is our water treatment plant right here, water treatment plant. I also have about two megs right here coming to the treatment plant. So here I have, um, I got about 8.7 million liters coming to the plant right now. And some of it's coming from a, a creek source and some of it's coming from a lake source. You can see my clear well right here is 91.8%. And that's that water that's directly after the treatment plant. Out of there, I'm gonna have a number of pumps. I'm gonna look at all my reservoirs here. So I have, say, I got one reservoir here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight reservoirs in my system. And right now, uh, you know, we'll see how much demanded it. So if I have 8.6 um, 8 coming in, you can see here right now I have 
5 million liters leaving the treatment plant right now going out to distribution. And that's, you know, it is still pretty early being six o'clock in the morning here. And I'm going to see that number start to come up a fair bit. All these reservoirs have a lot of water in it, which is perfect. This is exactly what I want to see at this time in the morning because I, I don't want to see these reservoirs low. People are getting out of bed now. You're going to be using more electricity and that's what I want to see. So this gives you an idea of, of what I do um, and what the operators see. They can take a look or they can move water around to make sure if there was a fire in any one of these zones, then we're able to go in and manipulate the system to get more water. I can turn a pump on here to provide more water to where I need to. Um, and right now, you know, this is a good spot to be in as um, demand starts to come on. All right. And the operators are just coming into work now, so I will give them back their, uh, their treatment plant and then we will move on with our, um, share it back to the presentation. All right. Can everybody see back? It should say atmosphere concept. Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Uh, how many operators do I have at the plant? Um, not, a, not a whole lot, really. I have one electrician. I have usually two operators per shift. So a shift will be six in the morning to six at night. And I actually have four operators, but they rotate through. So I'll have a foreman, two operators, and an electrician here. At, um, and that's a typical day for us here. You guys can see my uh, back to the PowerPoint, no problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll just close this down here. All right. Perfect. Let's talk a little bit again now about the piezometric uh, surface. And again, you can see in this, in this example here, uh, if I connect the tube to a side of a reservoir, um, I can actually um, tell you where the water is in, in that. Um, so basically, what I can do here, instead of putting a transmitter inside this big tank, I can have a little pipe on the side of that tank and put a, a transmitter into that tank. Um, it, this is what they would call a piezometric surface, and it makes, a, um, it makes it a lot easier to, um, for instrumentation. The tube itself, is, it's a piezometer. And I, we see a lot of piezometers in, uh, say if I had groundwater and I put a pipe in there and I put a measuring device and that is basically what they call a piezometer or free water surface. Let's talk a little bit about the pressure. And, and pressure head is the amount of potential energy that water possesses because of its pressure. And think about gravity, right? This is, this is where we start getting into gravity. Pressure is either measured by a piezometer or a pressure gauge. And pressure is really important. That's what moves this water all over the place. Here's a really neat uh, photo. I really like this one because it tells a good story. And I'll get my pen out again. The level in this, this reservoir right here is going to dictate the level across here. If I have my valve closed and no water is moving whatsoever, this is what they call the static pressure, right? And that static pressure is equal to the level in that storage tank. And you can see exactly. So if I have a house here, here, and here, all three of those houses are gonna have the same pressure right now. If no water is moving, so it's all hydraulically equal. The line that's across here is called the hydraulic grade line. And that basically is the line that's equal to the level in the reservoir. If it's static, 
that's the thing. If it's not moving, then it's all equal. It's what happens now when it starts moving. So let's take a look. I open that valve now and water starts flowing. There's going to be a pressure drop and that pressure drop is caused by the loss of energy and it's friction. Friction's inside your pipe, right? The walls inside your pipe is gonna have friction and it's going to slow down or have losses. And so that's what happens. Every time too, if there's a valve or a T or any time the water changes direction, it is a loss and it causes the pressure to drop more and more and more. See now, if you look what happened here in our last drawing, now that the water's flowing, it actually is moving the water down the hydraulic grade line. So basically you have it from here and it's working its way down and you can see how much losses or how much energy it took to get the water now to move through. So now every house here as it moved down has less pressure. And those are because of losses. One of the biggest things that I see out there is people design things or they have pumps and they don't account for the losses. And then it doesn't work. So what they'll do is they'll build a house saying, if I had enough pressure with no valves flowing, they will build uh, an upper floor or a washer on the top floor of their, their dwelling. And what happens in, you know, as this reservoir, remember if this reservoir starts to go down, so does this line. So, over, you know, so over time, um, you could actually lose water service in the upper parts of some of your buildings. And that's because the hydraulic grade line actually starts to lower as the water level starts to lower. And that's head loss due to friction. And basically, there's a bunch of different factors. The big one's the type of pipe. And, and this is a question on your ABC exam, is the type of pipe is going to be called the C factor. And the C factor has to do with how, um, how old that pipe is, um, what kind of pipe, how rough it is. You can imagine a nice plastic pipe is really smooth, whereas a concrete pipe is quite rough. How old is this pipe? A new pipe is going to flow a lot better than an old pipe. An old pipe is going to have uh, deformations in different over time. Corrosion or deposits. Some of that uh, ductile iron or, or cast iron pipe, uh, once they start getting deposits in it or tubercles, they call it, and it starts um, restricting some flow. It could have mud and roots in it. Maybe it wasn't a very good um, installation and roots got into the, the water pipe and that's going to cause some issues. And velocity. The more velocity, the more losses that happen. And so these are the big things that, that cause losses in your system. This is an interesting concept too. I like doing this type. Is pumps. Pumps basically create artificial pressure and it brings, it changes the hydraulic grade line. In this reservoir here, I have atmospheric pressure pushing on reservoir one in the picture on the right here. And it's gonna be pushing the water towards the pump. The pump center line is ground zero. As the pump turns, that water is going to get boosted up to here. So now that extra, extra power that was given it moved water from here to here, really. And that the pump provided that extra boost or that extra head pressure to get that water moving, which is great. That water by gravity was fed to the pump and they called this a flooded suction. That means that gravity was able to give a hand and the, we didn't have to lift the water too much which is perfect in this case. It's not always the case, unfortunately, but in this particular example, it was. 
some things that you should be aware of, especially from a test perspective, is that pump head or pump pressure measured on the inlet side of a pump is always called suction head or suction pressure. Pump head measured on the outlet side is usually called discharge head or discharge pressure. The difference in height between the inlet and outlet heads are proportional to how much work it's needed to raise that water from one side to the other. And this is called total head or total pressure. It's the measure of the total energy that a pump must develop in order to move water from one point to another. The head loss developed on both the suction and discharge sides of the pump might also be considered. And that's the problem. If I know I need this much pressure to bring water from the start point to the end point, I also have to build in, in my head the losses that are involved in this or else it will never work. Again, in our first example here, we're back to that. This first reservoir number one was able to provide some, you know, some gravity head in order to provide, um, if now that reservoir one was below here, right? I would have to have suction pressure to get it to the pump. So this is suction head and then discharge head to reservoir number two. And so the total distance to get water moving from here to here would be a lot more. In this case here, you have reservoir one with a flooded suction and that gives me some extra, I don't have to lift it, it went by gravity all by itself and that's perfect. Again, not always the case. And you can see here in this example, it took a lot more. I had to lift that water to the center line of the pump. The pump provided energy and brought it up to the reservoir, <coughs> suction and discharge. Now, also to keep in mind with, there's a bend here, there's a bend here, Right, you might have a check valve in here. This pipe might be rough on the inside, so there's going to be losses. And we also have to calculate the losses into this equation, or else it's not going to work properly. So, in essence, total head to make this whole thing work, you have suction head loss plus the suction pressure plus the discharge head plus the discharge losses, and that really equals the total pressure, the total head that's required to move the water from one reservoir to the another. So always make sure that you're calculating for head loss. All right, let's talk now a little bit about water system designs because again, it's really important to design these systems so that they work really well for you. A water distribution system is designed to deliver sufficient water quantity and quality to meet the demands of your customer. And for me, quality is number one. And quantity is, has to do a lot with our friend, the fire hydrant here, making sure that we're providing enough water to these fire hydrants. We talked about this a little earlier, <clears throat> knowing what exactly do you provide water for? Domestic, fire protection, industrial, agricultural, what, what, what's your customer base? And it's really important to understand what your customer is so that you can provide that service. When we talk about distribution pumps and stuff, um, high lift pumps are used a fair bit. So high lift and low lift pumps. Low lift pumps are used to bring water to a treatment plant. They call it low lift pumps. Any pumps used to take water away from a treatment plant is going to be called a high lift pump. And that means that there's no gravity to storage, right? So that is what it is. So think about that. Those are the two that, that are always um, used, low lift pump, high lift pump. When you're using these large pumps, it's really important to start and stop um, very, very carefully, slowly. Open any valves slowly. As you see in the picture here, 
if that's done incorrectly, you can split your pipes open. Water is really, really powerful and it can split these pipes really, really quickly. <clears throat> uh, negative pressure as well can collapse a pipe. So you also have to remember to keep positive pressure on at all times. One of the biggest uh, mistakes new operators make is they operate fire hydrants very quickly. So when you're opening up a fire hydrant or a valve, do it very slowly. If you don't, this is what happens. It will actually split, especially with some of the new plastic pipes that are on the market. It will actually split those pipes wide open. So very, very slow so that you do not create water hammer. Water hammer is also called a transient surge. And those are words that you'll see sometimes in the books. It's transient surge or water hammer. In our pumps itself, there's a number of different ways to run a pump, right? You just don't turn it on and electricity make that pump go. There's some different ways to do it that is a lot easier. Some plants will use a hydropneumatic tank. So basically that the pump doesn't have to go on all the time. It will fill up uh, um, that bladder filled uh, tank and, and keep the pressures very even. Some places, and we do that here, is we use something called a VFD or a variable frequency drive. And then what it will do is it'll look at a set point <clears throat> and try to match it. If my reservoir gets lower, my pump will speed up to match it. Um, and that's really good because if I have more demand, my pump will speed up. If I have less demand, my pump will slow down. And it allows me to keep my reservoir at a single stage. Um, soft starts we use a fair bit before VFD. And what that does is it will slow down the startup of a pump. It will go into stages. It will uh, start up very slow and speed up and then speed up and then speed up into a single uh, output. Um, it's not variable at all, it, but it takes, um, it ramps up very slowly to full speed and it protects um, for water hammer. If that pump came on 100% bang, I have an 18 million liter pump. And if that came on all at once without coming on slow, <clears throat> I would actually split open my pipe network and I don't wanna do that. So it'll come in slow. It will go four, six, 10, 12, 15, 18. It takes time to slowly get up there. And those are all configurable, but it protects your water system. All right, cross connection. We'll talk a little bit about cross connection control. And it's a, it also an important thing. We talked about that positive pressure concept, right? We want to make sure that it's positive at all times. If not, things can get in there. And there's lots of stuff, you know, contaminants enter the potable water system through a number of different ways, not just in the um, reservoir, but also, we see it a fair bit in the pipe network. Water breaks and, and things of that nature, even open up a fire hydrant, cause a lower pressure. So you have to be aware of that at all times, that it could cause issues. Inside your buildings, even, those are, you know, when you hook water up to a device, it could be even as easy as a coffee machine, right? You got to make sure that the proper... Uh, safeguards are in place or else you could have potential backflow and you don't want that. <clears throat> Back siphonage happens a fair bit too and it's the reversal of the hydraulic gradient. So we saw that hydraulic grade line earlier and if we reverse that the water is going to move backwards. And it could be uh, produced by a variety of circumstances. What would cause water to go backwards? One of the big things that I've seen a fair bit is hot water tanks or boilers. And we use that here a lot because it's cold, right? And we're going to heat the water in our house. So <clears throat> water comes in, it goes to a hot water tank, they heat the water. When you heat water, you know it expands. 
And sometimes when water expands, the pressure goes up. And sometimes that pressure can overcome the pressure of the water coming in. And the water will actually move backwards. And I've seen this happen a couple of times. And that's pretty scary when that happens. Um, you know, all of a sudden, boom, you got water, heated water going back out into the water main. And so you've got to be careful that that doesn't happen. <clears throat> Cross connection studies, man, this happens all the time. And again, there's lots of um, um, industry out there um, that create a cross connection. It could be a car wash, it could be um, a number, anything that uses water uh, from an industry, there's potential for cross connection. Um, because our piping system is, is always being altered and, and repaired, not just out on the road, but inside our, our dwellings and our businesses. And so we have to be always aware that there could be issues with a cross connection. Um, some of the big ones are, you know, like think about it, like funeral homes and stuff, right? They use water aspirators to remove fluids from the body. Hospitals are another big one. Dentist is another one right? Dry cleaners or any cleaners, anything that uses water is potential to have issues with cross connection. And the plumbing outfits too, right? Plumbing is, is sometimes um, installed by people who really don't understand what they're doing. And therefore, what happens is that, you know, um, a dangerous situation can occur, and they might not even know it. Especially you guys in your plants, think about it. you guys might be adding chemicals, whether that's chlorine or maybe in their coagulants, and maybe there's carrier water and water. And we got to be careful what we're doing in our plants because we deal with chemicals and that they're not going to cause a cross connection. So make sure that you know you've got a device in there that's going to protect you. Again, we got to make sure that this doesn't happen. It could happen at any time, you know, a fire. And I'll tell you a story. I had, um, we're reading our water meters. It was, it was uh, the last day of the month. We're going to read our water meters the next day. I had a water break and the guys went out, they fixed the water break. The next day, the guys went out and read the meters. Every meter on that street ran reversed. So that water break actually sucked the water out of people's homes back into the main because the main had a lower pressure because of a water break. So imagine if any of those taps inside those homes were hooked up to something illegal or something toxic, all that would be into the main. So it's really, really important to make sure that you're protecting yourself and your customer. Let's talk a little bit about some of these cross connections. And um, the big one is going to be something called uh, an air gap. And an air gap is actually the oldest and the most widely used way to protect yourself in a cross connection situation. Um, one big thing is that um, the air gap must be twice the, um, twice the diameter of the supply line but never less than one inch. They're gonna look like this. So one thing to think about is that diameter that you see there doubling. And there has to be a physical separation. I should be able to put my hand right across there and that protects you. It breaks any sort of vacuum or any sort of potential connection in an issue. But again, in our sealed pipe networks and underground, we can't really do this. So we have to find maybe a different way to be able to um, protect ourselves. Where I see air gaps quite a bit is say truck fills. When I told you that we didn't have uh, pipe networks that we actually had truck fill networks. And so a truck would come in and we would actually fill the truck from the top, making sure that there's physical separation between the truck and the actual water supply. And that's really important. 
In times where you can't really do that, we're going to use something called a double check valve. And it's two single check valves coupled in one body. And we'll see a picture of that in a second. And what it does, it, it basically protects you as the user. So water's going to flow in here. It has to overcome this check valve. It's going to come into here and it's going to have to go through another check valve and out it goes. So it has to go through two whole check valves, this one here and this one here. So if one failed, hopefully the other one holds. In the type, if I had say down, down, down here, and there was a water break. Now water gets stuck here, right? It can't come backwards. So it should protect us. It would have to get stuck between, you know, if that one failed, it'd have to get stuck on this one. <clears throat> it protects it from one way. So it always likes to have the protection. The thing about these devices is they're testable and they're testers that go out. And that's these things here. You can see these little valves here. And they're there so that a tester can come in and actually test if these are working correctly. And they should be test, tested yearly to ensure that they are working and making sure that this is going to work perfectly. And that's super important. And this is called a double check valve. And they call it double check valve assembly when it's all together in these in this fashion here. It's a big advantage. You know, it's got two independent check valves. It, they're, they're testable. And that's the biggest thing. They are assembly and they are testable. Um, it, it takes one pound of pressure per spring to open so you already know right there you got two pounds of pressure here you're going to lose in losses right off the bat here sometimes it's not enough to have those two check valves and so what we're going to do is something called a reduced pressure backflow assembly and it's another added level of protection like our, 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 um, our device here, and we'll see another picture of that, what they've done in, if they actually open down here and they put another valve in down here, and it's got a spout. <clears throat> so what happens if there was ever an issue, it would actually bleed the pressure off the bottom and actually drop the water. Instead of going backwards, it will drop the water through the bottom and a reduced um, pressure situation. It will just say, nope, we're done, and the water gets dropped out the bottom. Don't ever install these up in your ceiling because if they fail or if they, they get activated, you, you'll have a shower fairly quick. And I see that a lot of times. And this is called a reduced pressure backflow assembly. Again, it provides protection against back siphons and back pressure. So back pressure um, is something we didn't talk about yet. Back siphon is pretty easy. It's the reversal of flow. But back pressure is that sometimes that a pressure can be applied. So I see that with people in um, pressure tanks or pressure washers backwards. And you're actually creating pressure, more pressure than what the main has. Here's some pictures of some typical ones here. And you can see it also has the double check valves. That's my pink girl, she's red. So water comes in, it has to do the same thing. It has to overcome the spring, overcomes the spring and away it goes. If there was ever lower pressure, like a main break, what would happen is that the water would, this valve would open in the middle and the water would flow out the bottom on any of these ones. If anything failed, the water will flow at the bottom and it protects it from back siphonage or back pressure. It is, but you got to make sure these are connected or 
have the ability to drain and you'll see them you know the floor would be wet or something like that and that gives you a good indication of what's going on there All right, for our last one here, and this is the easiest one, is a vacuum breaker. And I see vacuum breakers a lot on janitor sinks and things like that. It makes a big difference. You put the vacuum breakers on uh, to protect you as your customer. And um, think about a hose and a hose outside are, are you know, most houses here have uh, a fixture on the outside of the hose. Let's see, right here like this. and you know, sometimes you're filling a bucket or filling a pool or filling something and you're just putting a hose in. If there was ever a problem downstream, it can actually suck the water backwards, backwards through that hose, back through the hose, out through back to the uh, distribution network. And that's not a good thing. So you have to make sure that you're protecting yourself at all times. What they'll do is they'll put this unit here it's a vacuum breaker and they'll screw this right into the um, right into the end of the hose where the hose hooks into this just screws in there and what it's going to do is it in the case of a lower pressure it would um, the lower pressure would cause the vacuum to open and dump out and you wouldn't get that back siphonage um, it won't suck water backwards. And it's good protection for you guys and good protection for your customer. All right. The last big one here is, is going to be water metering. And it's really important to do water metering. Um, you know how much water you bring into your treatment facilities and you know how much water you're supposed to have. Now, once it leaves your facility, it's out there. Some, some places in, in, in pump stations will have um, big flow meters and you can tell zone per zone what, how much water. But having water meters in everybody's home allows you to um, see what's going on. A lot of these new meters, they are on radio frequency. So you can log in and see what's going on. You can see if that meter is run backwards you can see if it has a leak. You can, you know, it tells you a bunch of things about uh, what's going on. And water accounting is huge, uh, not just here, but out in your system. Water loss is, is, is fairly large and 15% of water produced is sometimes lost from leaky pipes or, or pipes that are, you know, and that's not just inside a customer's homes, but your pipe networks out there. So, Two things, a meter is a great start to pinpoint issues inside a customer's home. Um, typically it's leaky toilets, that, that's their culprit, right? Um, inside of a home. And this will tell you about that. You'd be amazed how much water uh, per day a leaky toilet will actually, um, you know, it could be, you know, liters after liter after liter of water leaving. And that's wasted water. The other thing is water, in your distribution network. Um, there's um, leak correlators and leak detectors that allow um, you to make sure that you are actually um, keeping a good tab on what's going on out there in your system. You have to be able to see it. Um, so there's now teams of people, they will actually listen to the mains, um, listen to your services to see if it's leaking. Um, because really, uh, you pr produce all this water. You, you did all this treatment stuff that we talked about. We put chlorine in it. We stored it in our reservoir. We have to protect it now. It's really important that we protect it. We don't want to lose it. A lot of things that happen, especially for us here, a lot of our things are on a hill. And of course, if the water gets saturated in the, in, into the ground, it could sometimes come out or cause landslides or issues in your customers' um, yards and, and do damage to infrastructure. So we have to make sure that we're doing everything we can um, so that we can see the, um, or find where potential leaks are and get them fixed before they cause a lot of damage. 
When we talk about water meters, these type of meters you see here, this is your typical meter that is done on the small systems or small lines. They have a mutating disc on the inside. And what they do is they measure the amount of water going through. As we start getting into bigger flows, we'll use something called a compound meter. And a compound meter will measure two things, lots of water through the blue part that you see here and uh, a small meter on the side for small. So these are, say industry, our, our apartment buildings are bigger dwellings that have uh, more and more uh, units. Or you could also um, be very finite and look at just the toilet flushes or something like that, and it works pretty good. It gives you a really good idea of what's going on out there in your system. But two things I really like to do is making sure that, that, that you're maintaining um, your system, you're flushing your system through uh, UDF, and we're going to talk about that um, in chapter nine, a little bit about flushing and looping your system. Where, but for here, making sure you're monitoring your water. Where's it going? Who's using it? How much is there? And making sure that you're maintaining your system. One last thing too is maintenance. Um, I, I can't stress enough how much flushing should be done. And we'll talk a little bit about that next week. But the other thing that should be done is valve exercising and making sure that you are exercising your valve. And it's as simple as putting your valve key in and once in a while closing and opening your valve. It's the same thing with your main shut off inside your house. And we're gonna talk about that coming up here is making sure that that is done and so that you are protecting your system from, um, you know, if you have to shut it down in an emergency and it hasn't been touched in 20 years, chances are that valve's not gonna work. So really important to, even for your own houses, is to go in and close the valve and open it every once in a while to make sure in an emergency it's going to work. A lot of municipalities here and our valves are, are quite deep. They don't do that. So when it comes time to actually shut this thing down uh, in an emergency, it won't work properly. And that's a problem. So always keep that in mind. All right. So that is the end of our lecture for today um, for chapter eight. So hopefully that uh, you learned a little bit about uh, distribution and uh, a little bit about um, you know some of the storage and stuff. Again, your number one goal when it comes to storage is keeping that water nice and fresh, make sure there's enough for fire protection uh, and maintaining your system. You learned a little bit about the reservoirs and the reservoir systems. So it gives you a bit of an idea on how uh, those work. As we transition to Next week, now we'll talk a little bit more about the pipes and the piping network that carries that water and some of the maintenance that needs to be done. And a little bit more into hydrants and flushing and that maintenance component that, that's needed. Um, and then I think in further lectures, we'll be talking more in depth about the SCADA network and those type of things that we talked about earlier, um, which is pretty cool. And then probably finish our lectures near the end with water quality and some lab stuff and so that we can get a good handle on on the full package right from source water through the treatment through the distribution and how we maintain some of this stuff so next week uh, read up about pumps and pipe networks and we'll be talking a little bit more about about those things on our next lecture so thanks everybody and hope you have a, a good wednesday thank you mike and you have a wonderful day yourself and uh, thank you everyone for joining and hope you learned quite a bit. All the best. Have a good rest of the week. Bye.